So I truly believe that knowledge is power. And when I was first deconstructing, one of the things that was incredibly helpful for me was to do very in-depth Bible study. It is the core of the Christian faith. That is where everything roughly originates. And I wanted to know that if I was going to leave the religion and faith that I was raised with, I needed to know that I was doing it because it was what I truly believed and not just because I found some new preacher who disagreed. I wanted to know for myself to work out my faith in fear and trembling. And so that way, if and when I left, if anyone had questions, I could follow 1 Peter 3.15 and always have an answer for someone who asks you about the great hope in this faith that you have. So I want to share some of my study tips, the, the ones that are available online for free. Uh, so that way, if you are deconstructing or questioning, you can have some of these tools to enable your learning. So let's take a look. So the first thing that we are going to look at is it's just the Bible. Now there are hundreds of different versions of the Bible. Uh, and I'm not just talking about between different languages. There are immense differences in the meaning that is conveyed by by most of these different versions of the Bible. I mean, that's the whole reason why they are a new version. And so I want to take a look at a passage in a couple of different versions so you can see what I mean about comparing and contrasting. Now, Bible Gateway is my personal favorite for this. They have something like 40 or 50 different versions of the Bible built into them. So you have a wide array of information to dig into. So let's take a look at Isaiah 52 in the KJV. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth thou shalt no more come into thee, the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, O sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Now let's take a look at that same passage in the NIV. All right, and here... It says, Awake, awake, Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust. Rise up. Sit enthroned, Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, daughter Zion, now a captive. So you can see how that's put in a little bit more like plain English versus old English. And then let's look at an older version. It came before the KJV. There you are. The Wycliffe Bible. And this was, of course, written by John Wycliffe, one of the heretics burned at the stake by the Roman Catholic Church. So in his version, it says, Rise thou, Zion, rise thou. Be thou clothed in thy strength, Jerusalem, the city of the Holy One. Be thou clothed in the clothes of thy glory, for a man uncircumcised and a man unclean shall no more lay to, that he pass by thee. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall never again enter thy gates. Jerusalem, be thou shaken out of the dust. Rise thou and sit thou down, thou daughter of Zion, thou prisoner, unbind the bonds of thy neck. So you can see how the KJV is very similar to the Wycliffe Bible. It, it did come fairly shortly in the grand scheme of things after the Wycliffe Bible. But, you know, it, it's interesting to see how things kind of change as each successive generation tries to put the Bible into more plain terms of the day. So it tries to make it more understandable for the people of the day. 
and you you definitely end up with I would say social influences on the Bible because of how idioms and things like that are going to work as as the language changes. Now, in addition to just the Bible, a really good study tool is Strong's Concordance. Uh, this is both a concordance of Hebrew words that are used in the Bible, but also a Greek lexicon for Greek words that are used in the Bible. Obviously, this doesn't cover the Aramaic sections. Unfortunately, I really don't have a good online resource for Aramaic uh, translations, but this this will get you most everything. <laughs> so with uh, the Strong's Concordance, uh, you just type in a word that you want to look at. Let's see. Um, let's actually type in word. So in these results, you're going to have in the middle all of these different uh, English translations of the verses that use that English word. And let's take a look at a couple of these. So here we have Exodus 8.10, and he said, tomorrow, and he said, be it according to thy word. So a promise, a bond, etc. So we click on the number, and that says a word by implication, a matter as spoken of or thing, adverbally, a cause, act, advice, affair, answer, blah, 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 blah. So normal that you would uh, think of when you use the word word. Now let's get to the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, we have John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So let's look at the Strong's number for this one. This is Logos. It is from 3004. Now you'll notice every single one of these words uh, in, in Strong's Concordance has a number assigned to it. Each of those numbers helps identify which Greek or Hebrew word it's associated with without you having to be able to remember how to spell something in Hebrew or Greek. So it's very helpful and it's quick links that go back and forth between different words. So you can look at the etymology and all that good jazz. So for logos, it is something said, including the thought by implication, a topic, subject, or discourse, also reasoning, the mental faculty or motive, by extension, a computation, especially the divine expression, i.e. Christ, account, cause, communication, concerning, doctrine, fame, intent, matter, mouth, preaching, question, reason, reckon, remove, saying, show, speaker, speech. So many different things are packed into this one little word, right? And, and in most languages, you know, a word can have many different reasons and you figure it out based on the context. So if you want to look at a specific verse and look at all of the different Greek and Hebrew words that are used in it, you can get more of a feel for what that original intent may have been. So here's another version of Strong's Concordance called Bible Hub. And you can just look at different versions of the Bible up here. They don't have as many as Bible Gateway, but they have a lot of the big ones. And then you can, you know, look at them parallel. So you can see each translation side by side. Uh, they have sermons, Bible studies, topical studies, uh, but they do also include Strong's as well. And they have a couple commentaries. Uh, you'll notice that it has Strong's as well as Greek and Lexicon. That's because there are multiple lexicons, there are multiple concordances, uh, just like there's multiple dictionaries for English. Now you can look at the Bible verse, that, that John 1, 1, and you can see each word painstakingly broken down into the Greek so you can see each and every one right after the other. Now, these have a much more concise 
uh, definition that is listed, you'll notice from for logos it is it is much truncated from what we read on strongsconcordance.org. So you know, there's there's pros and cons to the different. I, I feel like this one is a little more user friendly, whereas the Strongs is a little bit more detailed. So, anyways, aside from just studying the Bible, you can also take it back to older forms. Uh, if you have interests in Calvinism versus Ar Armenianism, uh, the Wikipedia pages for things like the 39 Articles, Luther's Reformation, etc. You can actually find some good articles in here. Now, Wikipedia, for all of its faults, does have some really good sections. Now, the way that you can tell a good article on Wikipedia from a bad article is in the sources. So you'll have your citations, which link to specific claims that are made inside the article. And if you come down here and there's like one particular book or one particular author that is referenced 50 times, uh, probably not a great article. However, you have some like this that have numerous articles from various points in time. So this is going to be a much more well-balanced and thorough article. You also have links to the sources down here, so different books that you can read. In most of these cases, the link will take you to Amazon or Google Books or something like that so you can purchase the book. Occasionally, you're able to find something that is free online, but just be aware a lot of them are going to be taking you to where you would have to purchase the book. And in those cases, of course, utilize your local library. Now under the further reading and external links, uh, we have, you know, more books that are available but weren't specifically sourced in this article. So sometimes you'll find really cool little Easter eggs like this, the audio version of the 39 articles. You can come to this little website, download an MP3, put it on like a podcast, clean your house, and by the time you're done, you'll know a good deal more about the Reformation. So those are some really good resources within Wikipedia. I know it's not always the most trustworthy because of, yeah, you know, but it can absolutely have its place. Now, also, we have commentaries online. There is actually a computer program called Logos, and they are a pretty comprehensive study program. Obviously, there is a cost for the computer program, but if this is something that you're really going to be diving into for a while, it might be worth the investment for you. Uh, the Geneva Study Bible was written in 1560. And this one, I think, is important if you were raised in a Calvinistic uh, denomination, because this is very rooted in Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, etc. This is right after all of those Reformation confessions of faith were written, you know, the Gallic Confession, the Scott Confession, etc. So this is written right after those were done. So it is very fresh in all of that Calvinistic theology. So that can be really interesting to get not what the perspective is hundreds of years later after all these people have died, but to to actually have a commentary that was released during their lifetimes very nifty. Then we have John Darby's. I'm trying to remember the exact chronology here, but John Darby was a pretty pretty well respected for a decent amount of time uh, when it comes to commentaries and interpretation. Now you can also get into the specific confessions of faith, the creeds, and all of those because they, they are available all online with all the videos that I've done about the creeds and confessions, everything has been readily available online for free because these are just 
public domain shared things by churches and nonprofits and schools and stuff. So thankfully, these are, are readily available and very helpful for understanding the roots of whichever denomination you came from, comparing and contrasting different streams within the faith, etc. If you want more information on the specific creeds and confessions that are used amongst various Protestant denominations, I do have a couple of other videos to watch on that, so I'm not going to get back into that here. And I just want to, again, encourage you that if you are questioning, if you are deconstructing, even if you deconstructed a while ago and you just want to refresher, I guess. Study tools are incredibly helpful. Uh, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, baby. If anyone has questions about accessing any other resources, feel free to comment below and I will do my best to point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm.